that uh, Brother Leslie kindly read for us, to give a bit of background, a bit of context to the, the kingdom of Israel. Um, as I read that, it's a pretty sad indictment, isn't it, upon the people. Um, there were two verses that particularly stood in my mind, which will give some context for what we're going to discuss this night, namely Jezebel and Athaliah. We read that, didn't we, in verse 7. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. They'd seen all the plagues that came upon the Pharaohs and the Egyptians. They'd been brought through the Red Sea, witness miracles there. All the wilderness wanderings that they'd seen, that their fathers had seen beforehand. Yet when they got into the land, did they fear God? No, it said that they feared other gods. But worse than that, they walked in the statutes of the heathen. And Moses particularly told them, when you go into the land, if you keep my commandments, it will do well for you and you'll have prolonged days of life. And we know the northern kingdom was taken away for their wickedness. But just in the end of verse 8 there, um, they walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel, but the people also walked after the statutes and the counsel of the kings of Israel themselves. The kings were supposed to be promulgating God's word along with the Levites, the king was supposed to set the tone for the nation, how they should walk before God. But all they did was give a bad example. They worshipped other gods, and particularly um, Baal was one particular worship. But Jezebel and Athaliah, were they just passive queens going along with what the kings were doing? No, as we shall see. They were as bad, if not worse, than the kings of Israel. And in fact, Jezebel and Athaliah were actually motivators behind their husbands, the kings, and their, and their offspring to do evil and to do wickedly. And this indeed brought about the, uh, the ultimate downfall of the nation of Israel. And so I want to, just in this brief uh, talk this evening, just look at some of the passages, particularly in, in Kings and Chronicles. We're going to switch between the two uh, to pick up the... Uh, the story and the narrative and just pick up what kind of influence that these two women had upon the nation of Israel, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, upon their household and particularly upon the people because the people were easily led, weren't they, by the kings and particularly the queens as we shall see. Um, just the meaning of the word Jezebel, um, as we see there, it's often been translated Baal exalts or Baal is husband or unchaste, but when I've had a look at the word and the meaning of the word, different commentators say different things, so it's not really clear um, in what sense her name really means. Although I do think there is a connection there to, to Baal, um, and we shall see that as we go along. So what of her relations? Well, her father was Ethbaal, there's a bit of a clue there where, uh, where her upbringing was, and we'll look at First Kings uh, shortly. Her husband was, was Ahab, uh, the king of Israel, her sons, Ahaziah, Jehoram, that uh, she had with Ahab. And there were 70 other sons that Jehu slew in, in retribution for their wickedness. Now, we're not sure whether they came from um, particularly Ahab and Jezebel together or Ahab and, and other concubines or whatever. But you can read of those 70 in 2 Kings 10. And her daughter particularly was, was Athaliah, who we're going to study tonight. These two together were a formidable, a formidable force for, for evil and for wickedness in the nation. Just do a bit of a, um, a timeline there, or, or, or a tree, if you like, a, a kingly tree or a rulership tree. We know the divided kingdom after Solomon. He himself, at the end of his days, worshipped false gods, took strange wives that turned his mind away from God, and God decided he was going to rend the kingdom from him, but not in his lifetime for the sake of David, his father. So we can see on the... Uh, not very clearly. I think the battery must be gone. Um, on your right-hand side, Jeroboam is obviously the, the nation of Judah, and on the other side is, is Israel. And as we read through the, the, the times of the kings of, of Israel, how often do we read that such and such a king walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin? And, and we saw an allusion to that in, in the reading there. We know how he set up the false worship, the two golden calves, said, Behold, these are thy gods, 
that brought thee out of Egypt. Absolutely untrue. But he was very shrewd, very clever. He thought, well, if we don't have some form of worship in the northern uh, parts of Israel, in Bethel and in Dan, then the people might want to go back to Jerusalem to keep the Passover and other uh, festivals. And that might bring them back again to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the southern kingdom. So he set up this false worship, didn't he, in, in Israel. And worse than that, he set up his own priests of the lower caste, he said, of the, of the nation. Um, and they basically made up whatever they wanted to do. And they took the hearts and minds of Israel away from God. Indeed, they had a form of godliness, but not according to truth, we might say. But we read, and we will read, that the people sinned after the, the nature of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. In other words, they served false gods and did what they wanted to do. But as we go through and we come to the times of, of Ahab, there's another refrain that keeps coming out through the, through the scriptures, that the people followed after the wicked ways of the house of Ahab. And when, when we read through Kings and Chronicles, it keeps coming up time and time again. And we see, really, Ahab was bad, but it wouldn't have been half as bad as I'm sure if he didn't have Ahab to wife. So what then of, of Jezebel's uh, father, Ethbar? Well, he was a king of Sidon. We said he's the father of Jezebel. And Josephus has this uh, to say about him. He says, Ethbal is called Ithobalus by Menander, who also said that he was a priest of Astarte, from which we get our Easter, and having put the king, fellows to death, assumed the scepter of Tyre and Sidon and lived 68 years and reigned 32. Now we know Tyre and Sidon right on the, the, uh, on the doorstep of the northern tribes of, of Israel there. And clearly it was a mistake for Ahab to seek allegiance with such a, a wicked queen. But his upbringing actually, I think, drove him to seek um, a queen outside of the nation of Israel. And he was attracted to her for a number of reasons, which we'll, which we'll consider. So we can see that Jezebel's upbringing then. Some have said that she may have been a priestess as well in the house of her father, who was the priest, that she ministered also to the goddess Astarte and to Baal and other false gods. Uh, we can't really prove that, but it would seem fairly reasonable, perhaps, that she would have some exposure to that. And it seems to me that she was quite zealous, because when she came to, to uh, Israel, she forced her, her views and her beliefs upon Ahab and likewise he had no problem in, in taking those things up. Now when we look at Baal there's many figures that are that are uh, have been made, many casts, many inscriptions have been found of this of this god Baal. Uh, the Encyclopedia Judaica has come to the conclusion that really he's the god of the weather, controls the seasons and then then fertility. And we we got to see when we look at um, Elisha and, uh, and, and the, uh, the competition he had with the prophets of Baal, how this was going to be brought to a head, that the weather god was going to be defeated. So the story of Jezebel, I've sort of broke it down into three parts. We've got uh, the conflict between the worship of Yahweh, the true God of Israel, and the worship of Baal. That's a conflict that continued all the way through until eventually Israel were taken away out of the land for their wickedness. And we looked at the episode of Naboth and his vineyard. And then finally the death of Jezebel and her family as God's divine retribution upon, upon her family. So we'll look then at the conflict between the worshippers of Yahweh and the worship of Baal. Well, we said that Jezebel was very active in promoting the worship of Baal, starting with her husband, and that spread throughout the king's seed and throughout the people. Um, on the other hand, we've got the prophet of God, Elijah, that was trying, apparently against all the odds, to overcome this wicked reign of Ahab, and, and the wicked Jezebel. And Ahab, some have said he was, he was on the fence. He didn't know which way to turn between, between following what God wanted and following what Jezebel wanted. I don't think that's right. As we go through, he was more than pleased to partake of the, the wicked deeds and the, uh, the idolatrous worship of not only his father's, his father Omri, but also uh, through the marriage of Jezebel. I don't think he sat on the fence at all. He made himself very plain and very clear where his allegiance was. So we're going to look at a few scriptures just to get the, the story. So would you turn to 1 Kings 16 now? We just want to, to read we've got a few seconds just to get the context. We'll pick out some key verses that will basically 
give us a flavour of the influence that Jezebel had in the nation. So, verse Kings 16, verse 29 there. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of Yahweh, above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Zardonians, and went and served Baal, and worshipped him. But he did more than that, didn't he? Verse 32. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal. So not only was an altar, there was a house there as well, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This is not the man sitting on the fence, is it? This is a man that's really active. You know, um, We're not sure if he actually built the, the temple of Baal, um, but we know from other historians that part of uh, God's temple was actually um, deconstructed to get materials uh, to use in the worship of Baal, to, uh, to build a temple of Baal. So we've just got the key points there. He did even the sight of Yahweh of a ball that were before him. Now that's no light phrase, is it? We've had Jeroboam, the son of Nemat, he said that made Israel to sin. Omri did even more wickedness. And he said now that Ahab did even more than that again. And you can almost hear the incredulity in the, uh, in the writer of the kings there. He says, not only was he that bad, but he had the gall to marry Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, as though it had been a light thing, as always provoking the God of Israel, doing all these things, and then going against the commandments of God by taking a wife from a strange or a foreign country, when they were particularly told under the law of Moses to marry only of their own kind. The reason being, as Solomon found out, their minds will be taken away from serving the true God to worship the gods of the nations. And the Apostle Paul, doesn't he, when he speaks to in the Corinthians, you know, marriage is only in the Lord. Because a simple principle there, you know, if two are together, walking together, on the same mind, doing the same things, if it's in a godly sense, then it will be good. But if two are of the same mind, walking together, doing ungodly things, then that can only lead to destruction. And that's what Ahab found when he married Jezebel. We see there he served Baal, worshipped him, and reared up. So Ahab didn't sit on the fence. He was very active. <coughs> so was God going to allow this, this wickedness to continue? Was he going to, just going to allow Elijah to, to, to suffer at the hands of, of, of um, Ahab and Jezebel? We'll now read verse 1 there of uh, 1 Kings 17. That Elijah the Tishbite, and Elijah the Tishbite, was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And that was a very brave thing to do, wasn't it? Given that what was going on throughout the whole of the northern tribes there, you know, the people were given to idolatrous worship. The king was, was active in that. And there's Elijah coming before the king said, Before the God whom I stand. That's a wonderful lesson for ourselves. We live in a very similar age, an idolatrous um, society we live in, don't we? Where people will do whatever they wish to do. But Elijah there, he thought he was alone. There was others around him. But as, as far as he was concerned, he seemed to be like John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But nevertheless, he had, he had the, the strength to, to do that. Now, this is the challenge now. Will Baal, the weather god that controls everything, would he be able to go against the word of Elijah? He said there will not be any dew, not just rain, but even dew. God was going to control the atmospheric condition that there wouldn't be a dew nor rain unless God said so. So this was a challenge now that God was going to put through Elijah. Is Baal, the weather god, going to be the one that he should choose? Or is it going to be the God of Israel? that controls everything, that created everything. And that was going to be the test. So I think we know the story quite well, don't we, about that. But I just want to pick up some verses here, um, continuing in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 17 to 24. Just pick up some verses here. So it came to pass, verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, 
that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Now the goal of this man, <laughs> Elijah the prophet of God, he says, you're troubling Israel. Well, the king Ahab, he was doing everything he could to trouble Israel by taking away their very lives, by taking them away from God. So the goal of the man to say to Elijah, are you the one that troubles Israel? No, he's one to come to save Israel. But he said, he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed, thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel, and to Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We can see the, prom the promotion here of Baal and the worship. It didn't say Ahab's table, did it? It said Jezebel's table. She was actively encouraging, supporting, feeding all these priests and prophets of Baal. As we go through there, because there's just a couple of verses there that are interesting. Um, so verse 20, so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Carmel. And Elijah said and came this time to the people, not to, not to Ahab, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And what, the, what the people say? Not a word. Not a word. Well, we're not sure if Baal is going to be, defeat the God of Israel. Um, it could go either way. It could be a close run thing. I mean, the whole of the nation, if you like, they were torn between two things. And we think, well, how on earth could that be after what the people had seen? I mean, Israel's a small country, isn't it? You know, from Jerusalem to Samaria, it's not that very far. But it was so far removed from the worship of, of God um, in Jerusalem that the people weren't sure, really, who was in charge anymore. Who was going to bring about these things? And we see there the point to note that these prophets eat at Jezebel's table. Moving on then. Chapter 19. At this point, the prophets of Baal were totally defeated, weren't they? And the God of Israel defeated them and was true to his word. And the raid came according to the word of God. But we're interested in more in Jezebel. Chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Now, it didn't rain for quite a long time, did it? Three years. And the people could have thought, well, yes, they said, didn't they, that Yahweh, he is God, and that Baal had been defeated. So Jezebel, you think, might have been humbled now to say, well, actually, we must admit that this weather God did nothing because the God of Israel controlled the weather and brought the rain. But was she, was she humble? Was she humble by that? No. We read there that Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life. This was a woman that was, that was shameless but she was very astute, wasn't she? If she gets rid of Elijah, and the people won't hear the word of God, then I'll reinstate more prophets of Baal, and more priests of Baal, as if she could defeat the God of Israel and his prophets. But such was the nature and the character of this, of this, hardened, this hardened woman. She was very astute politically as well, as we shall see in the episode of Naboth. Would you turn there to 1 Kings 21? Now, we know the story, so I'm not going to read it all, but Ahab, Jezebel's husband, as we know, wanted a vineyard that was near his villa or his palace near Jezreel. Naboth didn't want to sell his inheritance, and so Jezebel decided that she was going to take matters in her own hand and would arrange for the, the death of Naboth. So just look at verse 7 there. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And, and, the, and the rest we know, we know very well, don't we? So she was very crafty. She was very cunning. She went behind the king's back, took his seal and sent the letter. He didn't know what was going on. This is how weak Ahab was. But she did this. She wasn't going to let the God of Israel 
win. How much less than this, this, uh, this lowly servant neighbor? This, she wasn't going to stand in his way. He wasn't going to stand in her way, rather. So she said, I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the, the, the Jezreelite. Now, it's interesting that as we go through the account there, he says that there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of Yahweh. But it was because of Jezebel, his wife, that stirred him up and encouraged him in all these things that he did this wickedness. So we, we think perhaps the king was in charge, but really, I think Jezebel was an absolute driving force behind this marriage. And God was allowing this, partly as punishment for the people that were doing their wicked ways, but he wasn't going to let, obviously, this, uh, this Phoenician woman to, uh, to usurp authority over him. But we can see, though, can't we, that a weak husband and a forceful wife is a recipe for disaster if the marriage is not conducted under the precepts and commandments of God. If it is, then the weak husband will be supported by the forceful wife and vice versa. But in this relationship, an ungodly relationship, it was to be the undoing of Ahab and his household. Verse 17 to 19 now in the same chapter. And the word of Yahweh came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed, and also taken possession? Well, he hadn't really killed, had he? No, his wife had done that, but as far as God was concerned, the head of the family was the husband was the king. So whatever acts his wife had done, he was responsible for that, and he should have taken more control of the situation. But he didn't, but God lays the responsibility at his, at his doorstep. And I shall speak, he continues unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. This is a real irony here, isn't it? A real retribution from God. You think you've got away with this? Well, his blood was spilt, Guess what? Your blood's going to be spilt in the same manner. But, verse 23 there, and of Jezebel also spake the Lord. God obviously knows what's in the heart of men and women, and he knew exactly what was going on in this relationship. He knew that Jezebel was the driving force behind it. So she wasn't going to get away with this at all. And he said, the dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Now, Ahab is going to die in Naboth's vineyard, but God has probably chosen particularly uh, the, uh, the wars of Jezreel and the timing to suit her death. We're going to consider that. Just keep your a marker there. We're going to go to Second Kings now for another reference here. I think we need to, to read these different accounts because it helps us to big, build up a story and a picture of what's, what's going on. So 2 Kings 9, verse 22. God had promised that he was going to bring judgment upon Ahab and upon, upon Jezebel. So 2 Kings 9, verse 22. And it came to pass when Joram saw Je Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And we know that Jehu was going to be the one that's going to bring the judgment upon the house of Ahab. And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. He didn't say, how awful is your father, what he's done in the nation. No, again, the word that came to, to, uh, to G here was that it's the whoredoms of your mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts. This is what's going to bring all this about. And we know the account that, uh, that, that G here went on to destroy and to kill Joram, um, the son. But we just want to look at verse 30 here of this chapter. When Jehu was came to Jezreel, as God had promised, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her head and looked at the window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? In other words, if you slay me, will you have peace, Jehu? Well, Jehu was pretty hardened and he wasn't going to have any of this. What did he do? Verse 32, he lifted up his face to the window and said, who is on my side? Who? And they looked out to him, two or three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down and sprinkled some of her blood, and some of her blood, rather, was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses 
and he trod her underfoot with his horse. Just pause there for a minute. She thought that she could make herself attractive to Jehu, that by craft and stealth she, she, could, she could lure him, as she'd done with Ahab. You know, no doubt she had Ahab around her little finger, so to speak. And she thought, well, you know, who is this Jehu? You know, who is he to come and come against me? So she thought by dressing up, it says that she painted her face, it's a Hebrew word, to put, we have our expression, don't we? She put on her face, she put on her makeup. That's exactly what she did. And she appeared at the window, you know, tried to entice him and to lower his guard. Uh, didn't get her very far. She ended up in a, in a heap on the floor, didn't she? Um, so, we said, so they threw her down. But it's, it's amazing how detailed the scriptures are. Because we said there, she was thrown down. She was trodden underfoot, wasn't she? And Jesus said, look, go and bury her. But when they went there, there was nothing left, was there? But the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. The dogs, it would appear, had eaten all the rest of the flesh in probably a very short period of time while Jehu was inside having some refreshments. When he came out, there was nothing left of, of Jezebel. And what did he say? He said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake by servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, in the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. Now, we're not told what really effect this had on the people round about. It clearly was only very fleeting if it had any positive effect. But God would say something, and he would bring it to pass. None of the gods of the nations could do that. But God was doing that. He said when it was going to happen, by whom it was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and where it was going to happen. And all these things came to pass. Um, and no doubt there were people in Israel that would have took comfort and courage from this, but wouldn't dare show any allegiance to the God of Israel for the fear and retribution of, of Ahab and Jezebel. Well, the reference, isn't there, in, in Revelation, and, and quite reasonably so, when we read Revelation 22, verse 20. Let's just turn there, just one verse. Um, the, the fame, if you like, or the infamy of Jezebel and all the, the, uh, the influence that she had on her family, on her household, and particularly on the nation of Israel. It's quite fitting, I think, that the book of Revelation, when the letter to the Ecclesia at Thyatira, uh, clearly in the midst of the ecclesia there was one that said God said against or Jesus said against her not uh, against Thyatira rather notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servant to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols so nothing's changed really is it you know it's not in Israel now it's, it's in, up further in the north, Asia Minor. But it's the same principles, isn't it? This woman, whoever it was in, in this ecclesia, was purporting to be a prophetess of God. It was a wrong God in this case, and a cause of people to commit fornication. And I think by that it seems to worship false religion. They fornicate themselves, if you like, by going against God and worshipping other, other gods around the time. So she was really an archi uh, a, a archetype, prototype, whatever you want to call it, that Jezebel, she really was the mother of harlots in that sense, wasn't she? And that epithet is picked up then and obviously taken through, through to the papacy. And just like Jezebel, and all the false gods will be cast down as, as Jezebel was. And I think that's the lesson that God, through, through Jesus, through his angel, in, uh, in Revelation there, said, go and read about what Jezebel did, what her end was, and learn 